Hi everyone, this year so many great devices have been released that it's sort of difficult to decide which one to get. So we've made this handy dandy guide so that if you're not a tech whiz, you don't have to ask a million questions. And if you are, you don't have to answer a million. I'm Angie for GS Marina, and this is how to choose a phone that's perfect for you. This is not the most fun place to start, but it's really important. Make a budget and stick to it. Higher tier phones have gotten really expensive this year and lower tier phones have gotten pretty affordable and really, really good. You'll find some excellent devices for around a thousand bucks, but for most people, that's not the smartest purchase decision unless they're getting a serious discount. And in fact, you can probably find a really good phone that fits all your needs for half the price. If your budget is 450 bucks and above, you're looking at this year's flagships. If you have 200 to 400 bucks to spend, you're looking at this year's mid-rangers or last year's flagships. Older flagships offer faster chipsets and better cameras, but less battery efficiency, while mid-rangers offer better battery efficiency, newer software, and sometimes features like waterproofing. Under 200 bucks, you're playing the budget game, which means that if you're keen on a lot of features, be prepared for some compromises. If you're smart, you can get a phone that has the one or two features that you want and need the most, but the phone will probably skimp on the other ones. Speaking of which, make sure to isolate needs from wants. A lot of manufacturers push the best screen, the best camera, the best whatever, but while that's great for innovation in the industry, that might not be what's best for you, especially when it means spending hundreds more on a device. Now, I know this is a very sensitive topic, but we have to talk about Android and iOS. If you're stuck with one operating system and want to switch to another, but are too scared because it's too difficult or you lose all your data, don't be, there's a lot of apps that make switching very easy. If you're worried about a particular app, nowadays most popular apps will be available on both types of devices. And you can always check the App Store or the Play Store to be sure if you have something that's more specialized. iPhones have traditionally been more expensive but easier to use, and Android has traditionally been more flexible with more features and cheaper. This year, that's definitely been turned on its head since there have been really beautiful, well-designed, super expensive devices from both camps. As Google's design has become more intuitive and refined, it's really a toss-up as to which is better. Okay, so now you've got your budget and an open mind, and you're ready to dive in. First, choose the size of your phone. Do you want the biggest screen possible for YouTube and coffee in the mornings, or do you want something that's usable with one hand? Even if a phone is comfortable to hold one-handed, you still might have to shimmy your hand up to access notifications. So if you have really small hands, it might be really annoying. When you're looking for the best display possible, you want good contrast, good colors, great brightness, but not necessarily amazing pixel density. You will notice if your phone is not bright enough to read outside, and you will notice if you have really ugly colors. However, you might not notice a huge difference between 1080p and 4K. With that in mind, you should generally strive for a pixel density of around 400 ppi. Pixel density isn't generally that important, unless you have a virtual reality headset or have amazing vision. Though, if you're using that VR set constantly with the screen this close to your eyes, that might not be a problem for very long. Cameras are some of the biggest selling points of phones nowadays. But nowadays, megapixels don't really matter. Photo and video quality depend on the phone's sensors, chipset, software processing, and aperture way more than megapixels and actual image size. So if you want to find the best camera in your budget, you have to compare photos and videos, not specs. Phone cameras' biggest weaknesses are night shots and really contrasted light conditions. This is sadly one of those areas where buying an expensive phone might make a huge difference. If you're the sort of person that likes to take a lot of videos, make sure that the videos themselves have stabilization and good detail. Make sure that you're going to be getting the battery life that you need. Some people don't mind charging their phone more often, but others have higher expectations. If that's you, remember that a bigger battery doesn't always mean better endurance. If an Android phone has a 4000 mAh power pack, it'll probably last you ages. But since batteries are bulky, phones usually have less than that. There are two numbers that you really need to care about. The first is screen on time. This is how quickly the battery dies when you're actively using the phone. It's an imprecise metric, however, since everybody uses their phone differently and you can't rely on getting a similar screen on time as another user. The other thing that you need to pay attention to is total battery life. This is how long the phone will last with average use, including the time that the phone spends in your pocket. Some phones have good screen on times, but die really quickly when they're in your pocket, and others have the opposite problem. 
And remember, these numbers are an average and not a guarantee for how long the phone will last. They are the most useful when comparing the battery life of all the phones that we've tested so that you know which phone is better and by how much. So I bet you've noticed that a lot of phones have glass backs, which allow for wireless charging. But what you might not be aware of is that wireless charging isn't that good. It's actually really slow. And in fact, there's another technology that you should be paying attention to instead, and that's quick charging. Some quick chargers are really awesome and they can charge your phone up to 50% in half an hour or sometimes even more. And you're gonna find yourself in way more situations where you need a quick top up versus that one Starbucks in your area or that one airport that has a wireless charger which saves your life. If you get a phone that has less than 32 gigabytes of storage, you're gonna have a bad time no matter if you have an iOS or Android device. Many phones don't come with expandable storage, and even if they do, that's not a guarantee that you'll be able to use that SD card for apps. If you have 16 gigabytes or less, also remember that the operating system also takes up space. As a rule of thumb, SD cards are great for photos, videos, and maybe music if you download it, but as far as apps go, they're only good for Android 6.0 and up. Also, if you think that you're gonna survive 16 gigabytes in cloud storage, you're right, but you're not gonna have a good time. And I speak from experience. Make sure that your phone can survive your environment. Even if you're a very careful person, a phone is always on you and accidents do happen. Check out drop tests, scratch tests, underwater tests, and generally make sure that your phone can survive the bulk of what you'll throw at it. Personally, I need a waterproof phone because I've seen at least three people destroy their devices in foreign countries in toilets. The chipsets I've listed here are all flagship level. They include the future Snapdragon 845, which will replace the 835. As for RAM, 3 to 4 gigabytes is a great place to start. More RAM equals better multitasking and more apps that you can have open all at once. Now that you've compared specs and found a list of devices that you like, find a store, any store. You're not necessarily gonna be buying from there, but you have to meet your phone in person. What you love on paper might annoy you in the hand. Maybe it's too slippery. Maybe it has a weird edge. Maybe it's really, really blocky. Maybe something just doesn't fit. You won't know until you actually feel the device in your hands. Also, while you're there, make sure that you like the phone's unlocking method. There's generally a few really common biometric unlocking methods, including face recognition, touch ID, or iris scanning. The last one being sort of rare in more Samsung's thing. This is sort of underrated, but it's something that you'll have to deal with every single time you touch your phone. So if you hate face scanning, don't get the iPhone 10. If you wear gloves all the time, make sure that the phone has a face unlock option. Face unlocking is available on Android, but it's not gonna be as secure as Apple's. However, you will have Touch ID, which is more secure than Face ID. Play around with the user interface and make sure that you like it because there is a limit to how much you can change it and every single manufacturer seems to have their own version of Android nowadays. Of course, there is this trend where stock Android is becoming more of a thing, but it's not yet enough of a thing for you to really rely on that. Speaking of which, if you are into Android, make sure to get a phone with the latest operating system or at least a last year's update. For right now, that means Android Oreo and Android Nougat. Don't count on getting major updates from most manufacturers, so make sure to be happy with the package that you're gonna get on day one. There are a few exceptions to this, like the Pixel phones, but for the most part, this is the way the industry works. While you're there, open a bunch of apps, type, play a game, take a selfie, use the camera app, make sure that everything is the way that you want it to be. If everything checks out, you might have found your perfect match or you might have found several. If that's the case, hit the subscribe button down below and check the little bell to get our latest video reviews. Also, check out our website at gsmarina.com. See you next time.